Next we have Catherine Bukowski, and she is here with us from Virginia Tech College of Natural Resources and Environment. And she will be talking to us about taking stock of community food forests in, uh, taking stock of community food forests in the United States. Hi. Uh, so my research is exactly one of the research that Stephen was talking about, and I'll actually be going to visit his site as part of my research after this conference. Um, just bear with me today. Uh, this was an interactive presentation that we had to turn into a PDF, so if any part of it falters, I'll just keep rambling. Um, one of the points of community food forest that Stephen was starting to touch on, and then I'll talk a little bit more about, is that it's starting to change a food culture across in the country. And on the way here, we stopped at a place called Bloomington Orchards in Bloomington, Indiana, which is much more than an orchard at this point. It's definitely a food forest. It has multi-layers. And I was talking to the person at the hotel, and I told them that that's what I was in town for. He asked me if I wanted to go see anything in town. I said, no, I'm here for a purpose, Bloomington Orchards. And he just kind of was like, OK, like he had never heard of it. And then a few minutes later, he goes, you know, you mentioned orchards. You might be interested in um, the store that just opened up down the street. And uh, well, I wasn't, because this isn't the type of food that I'm going to be interested in, but that's the type of like food culture that these type of initiatives are starting to change, is that this isn't necessarily the type of fruit or vegetables that I'd like to buy. Um, but I found that interesting, because that's what most people think of when they think of food. They just go to the local grocery store or supermarket to buy it. And they don't understand the process of, of food production. Sorry. Okay. OK, so the reason that I chose this slide is to show how this fits into the larger landscape. And I'll talk to you a little bit about what community food forests are, which will be pretty much reinforcing some of the stuff that Stephen has already told us, uh, where they're located, and when they've started emerging in this country. And then I'll talk about the social components, like some of the motivations and key players. You were just asking about that. I'll talk about some of the partnerships that I've seen that are helping to form these. I'll talk about the methods that I'm using and how this might fit into agroforestry. As Stephen mentioned, these are forest gardens, also known as food forests. And if you're using NRCS language, multi-story cropping systems. This is the most used illustration for all the food force that I've seen to explain this type of system. When they're scaled up to the community level, they're usually located on public property, vacant lots, or leased or donated land. There's multiple stakeholders involved in the establishment. That might, some of those might leave the partnership in the long term, but partnerships are formed for management. And generally, the site is open to the public for harvesting. Sometimes it's a nonprofit where the food is donated to a food bank. And foraging is encouraged, which is also important for agroforestry practices. Mostly done by volunteers, participate in planting and maintenance. And the focus, of course, is on perennial species, but annual species are integrated so that people have a crop that they can recognize. So in the urban landscape, it's no, there's a growing desire for our landscapes to be more interactive and for people to have a little bit more ownership over shaping their landscape. A parks and recreation person just told me the other day that that was one of their biggest challenges, that they really wanted the local communities around parks to be taking a more active role in them. And one way to do that is through installing community gardens or uh, food forests. So community gardens are growing in interest, and 35% of all households in America are growing food at home or in a community garden. And that's up 17% in five years, according to National Gardening Association. And the largest increase in participation is coming from younger households, which is up 63% since 2008. I want you to pay, pay attention to 2008. That's going to come back up. Two million households, two million more than those numbers are in community gardening, two, up 200% 200 since 2008. Now, the difference in community food for us is that rather than growing food in little allotment gardens where people are coming together, but they're growing food for themselves and in their own individual area. Community food forests have people coming together to grow food together on one plot where they can all share the harvest or people can come. 
that have not helped plant and still take food from it because one of the major motivations is food security and providing food access to everybody. So they're collaboratively growing the food. And again, they're using these systems that mimic a forest structure and still offer places for recreation and walking paths. Another difference is that they are encouraged to take home vegetative cuttings for propagation in their own yards, regardless of how small of an area they have. So they first started emerging in 2008, which is why I wanted you to pay attention to that year. Asheville, North Carolina is an exception. That was started in 1998. Most of them started happening around the economic recession, when a lot of people started to worry about how they would provide their next meal, so community interest in community gardens, and this new way of, gro new way of growing food with food forests also started, not surprisingly, on the West Coast. In 2009, Beacon Food Forest, which is the most highly publicized food forest, um, claiming the first large-scale public food forest, took off and got a lot of press, and that got other people interested in it. 2010, I was just recently told there was a national conversation going on that people tapped into. That came out of one of my interviews um, when I asked why they were interested in starting a food forest. They said, we could tell there's a national conversation going on about how people are starting to use edible landscaping. We were interested and we wanted to have it in our, in our community. 2011, there was an Occupy movement, and that brought a lot of people together, sitting together, talking about what needs to change, how could they do it, and how could they do it in their, in their own community. And I've heard at least a few times um, people tap into that social network again to get people involved in doing the first planting for community food forests. 2013, explosion. I mean, now this is getting the news more, people are hearing about it, and although these may not all have been established that year, they've started talking and getting the planning going, and the process can, the process for planning these, depending on how thorough they are, can take up to two years. 2014, I'm probably 100% sure I don't have them all listed on here. Um, I'm pretty much finding these through word of mouth and online, so I'm sure there's others that I don't know about. Just driving around here last night, we saw out of a landscaping, so I'm sure there's others, and they're growing. Where they're located coincides with where the highest population growth is in the country, which is the map up above. I've mapped about over 40 of them at this point, um, and again, they're growing. I haven't updated this in probably about five months, and we'll take a look at what some of the different ones look like. This is in Philadelphia. You can tell that this one doesn't have quite as many layers as like a forest garden multi-story cropping system might have. It's a little bit difficult to find the path. Um, so these are some considerations that I'm looking at, taking stock of them and trying to produce best practices for what really will involve people in getting to know these systems. Here's the oldest one, at least on the East Coast, that was started in 98 in Nashville, North Carolina. Um, at this point, it's completely shaded out the understory. Here's Bloomington, where if you don't want to go to the new market to get your fruit, <laughs> you could go to this great orchard that has a lot, of, a lot of production in it, multiple varieties of apples, pears, um, peaches, plums, and now they're putting in different berries on the underla understory. And as we'll see, la see later, um, also establishing areas to grow mushrooms. This is Basalt, Colorado. That was just established um, last spring, and they integrated it right into a park that was not being used otherwise. And on the other side of where those students are learning about a food forest is a river. And so it's also serving as an extended area um, to help some of the water comes from where I'm taking the photo from, which is mostly pavement. And this is in Santa Barbara, California, where water is a little bit more limited. And I don't know if you can see it or not, but I don't have a pointer. Up in that back area, you can kind of see like a dark rectangular object. And one of the important things about these sites is that people are very experimental, and they're experimenting with fog catchment devices in order to make that some sort of um, way to get a little bit more water on the site, and they figure they can experiment with it here first, and then if it works, they could promote that to local agriculture. So 
I've been going through the different websites and the different promotional materials um, for these sites and highlighting some of the motivations behind them, which is strongly food access, but also community education and social justice. Environmental benefits, changing the food culture, building community, food security comes up over and over again. And I want to point out that the goal is not that any one of these small sites is going to be the answer to food security, but it's teaching people how to grow food again, because many people don't know how to or don't feel that they can. It's teaching us how to do it in different ways that seems more manageable in the long term with some reduced irrigation needs perhaps, things like that. Um, and it's just teaching people how to be involved in their environment again and that we're part of it. And so these have benefits for public health because it's getting people out there, it's getting them moving, and it's getting them to start thinking about nutrition and other aspects of the food culture. And it's also teaching them about seed saving. In basalt, the food forest is also incorporated with the public library where they have um, local seeds saved and the, the crops keep they have a section that they just let go to seed every year so that they have more climate sensitive, um, regionally appropriate seeds uh, for their local gardeners and community. So this logo down here from oil dependency to local resilience is from Transition Towns. If you haven't heard of that movement, it's constantly growing in the U.S. and it's a very strong proponent of these systems, mostly because it uses permaculture as a way of teaching people how to do this. The Occupy um, movement moved on to Occupy Vacant Tracks and e Eating Local. And the Slow Food movement is also promoting food for everyone and to grow it slowly in these systems, which is really important because this is also teaching people that when you plant a fruit, tr fruit tree, a nut tree, you might not get a return for five years. And so it's also teaching people how difficult it is for our other farmers to produce some of these crops that we're interested in. There's multiple stakeholders involved. Parks and Recreation is one of the top ones. Public Works. Places of worship tend to have areas where they can put in um, more permanent plots for um, community gardens, and they usually want to do some sort of good for the public. Community-based organizations are forming around them, or volunteer collectives. Nonprofits help to find funding. funding. Um, town horticulturalists are often involved, landscape architects uh, help with the design, and urban affairs and planning is one of the most, like, that I see, one of the departments most often in educational institutes that are helping with these initiatives. So my methods right now are um, completely qualitative. I was using quantitative last summer to look at some of the vegetation structure. That part is completely too dynamic in the first few years of these sites. And within one volunteer working day, my data completely changed. So I am now focusing so strictly on the social part. Um, doing interviews with key leaders to get their experiences and perspectives, talking to people like Steven, how did they get started in it, taking video tours of the site to capture some of that structure, um, talking about unique components, what parts do people get excited about. And then I'm trying to do group meetings to talk about what's happening at different stages of the project management process. Initiation, planning, execution, management, and rather than closing down a project, we switch that to future visions and what constitutes success. The framework I'll be using to analyze this um, data is from Cornelia Flora, who's here for uh, Community Capitals Framework. And I'll be pulling out different elements of all these different capitals. And I've put up some of the photos right now of some of them. So the cultural capital, that photo there, they've included a space in the middle where people can come together, they can do yoga, they can have community events, and they can create a different culture around food. And it's teaching people different food sources that are available. It's building natural capital. It's providing um, services for pollinators. In the top left, it's providing places for people to, co to come together. That picture is from Troy, New York, where the food force is on the edges of a lot that is now used for peace rallies, which that was because there was a, a murder in the same neighborhood, like right down the block. Um, and it's teaching people that that's part of a safe place. And financial capital is strongly in the public health realm, getting people out there. Um, Political capital, these are people sitting down to talk about the food forest and the planning process. And it's teaching them about governance. That's the mayor of Davenport who got involved in planning at Davenport, Iowa. 
got involved in the planting of that food forest for food security within their community plan. It's building social capital as children are playing in the basalt community food forest. The parents are standing around talking. And it's increasing human capital as people are learning new skills and being able to share their knowledge. So let's take a look at one of the um, natural capital and how this could also relate to agroforestry and potentially riparian buffers is that within an urban ecosystem, stormwater runoff and water management in general is important. So we're going to take a look at Providence, Rhode Island as an example. This is the area surrounding a park, Roger Williams Park. And we're going to zoom in to an area in the corner where there's an arboretum, which a man-made lake is around. And they decided to put in a community garden in this area. But there was a large area over here that was still grassland and had a lot of runoff coming off the community garden in that area. And that's where they decided to put in a food forest. That was the design for the food forest in the bottom left corner. And if, if you can see sort of the triangle in the food forest, if you're standing at the corner of that right there, that's what it looks like from on the ground last summer. And now off to our left, which is something that they had not planned for, but I think goes to show how these can contribute to, to habitat and other environmental benefits, is that now they're protecting it for nesting turtle habitat. And so it's also getting people to start thinking how we can use these perennial polyculture systems for conservation as well. So again, waterways around it, you're extending a little bit of that forest buffer, and then over on the left side, um, right between the, for the food forest and the community garden, is now turtle nesting habitat. Okay. So the implications I see for agroforestry products are that people are walking by these edible landscapes, trying different, trying different foods, and it's providing a test, it's a testing ground for agroforestry fruit and nut products. And it's educating consumers on alternative forms of agricultural practices. A lot of the people that are involved in these are also the people that have um, expo expendable income that are interested in buying these products as well. And so we should be targeting them. It's a segment of consumers that are more inclined to purchase products in a sustainable way and potentially that have a certification to them. And they're, they're active change agents in their community. So when Mark Shepard was talking earlier about people going to DC, these are some of the people that we can get on our side to push for these type of policies. And so we should be targeting education to them for agroforestry as well. And, like I said, this is the Bloomington Orchards. They're starting to teach people also how to grow mushrooms, um, wine cap mushrooms in this case. And so it's really opening them up to agroforestry products and getting people to want to demand this for themselves. Oh, I think I missed it. So taking it to outside of the urban area and into the agroforestry farm systems, um, again, it's not so much taking agroforestry adoption to the farmer as it is the consumer and having them more educated about specialty crops, interest in the policies, potentially certified labels, and a growing awareness in general of perennial tree-based cropping systems and how difficult it can be to grow crops in the system which will give them a better understanding of the prices that are set. And I've heard that over and over that, oh, we completely failed our first year and this be like these things, fail. you know, and so they're starting to learn that this is something farmers actually go through too. So in summary, um, this is a photo of Iowa City, where I came from yesterday, One. visiting the food forest that's there. We. Food forests are growing in popularity in the United States, and they should be considered an agroforestry practice. They are internationally. And when we're talking about bringing diversification or gender equality into agroforestry, we also need to bring diversity with other cultures into our temperate agroforestry practice here. Um, we have a lot of people coming into our cities that may have potentially been landowners in another country. We should get them involved in these systems, and I'd like to personally see more diversity um, culturally in agroforestry in this country as well. There's untapped resources that we can pull ideas from. These initiatives are creating educated consumers interested in agroforestry products and production systems. And more importantly for agroforestry is that people are coming in as in these type of initiatives, and this goes back to Katie and your question, it's coming through language that resonates with their values. And when our people are connecting to these social movements that you know, support this type of food production, we're not really incorporating some of that language um, and targeting those people when we talk about agroforestry. And it's also through social media and publications targeted for more general audience. 
I'll get back to that in one second. Planning and management information to guide these communities is highly needed. It's the most sought after thing when I go to visit them. They always want to talk with me afterwards because they really have no idea what they're doing and they're just like grasping for resources that they can find. And I've also heard that depending on where they're located, they're not really getting help from some of their, their local parks and rec. Um, their sources that they would go to that are more agency related, I would say. So when I talk about the internet and social media, that's an important part that we really need to focus on. I try to use this as a quick example. When you Google agroforestry, just the images that come up are these large production systems that I might not think that I have any, anything to do with if I'm in an ur urban area. And I see tropical, and I see temper, I see Africa. But I don't really see, there's not, those diagrams up there don't, aren't quite as inviting as some of this which is what comes up when you Google permaculture. So these are really colorful. They're showing diagrams. They're explaining how to do things. And even agroecology has a good mixture of both of these things, and it seems a little bit more accessible. The books that come out, the books that people are actually telling me are the, some of the go-to things, are accessible to a general audience. And this is what people are using to educate themselves in order to get involved in these systems. In contrast to agroforestry, which has a few textbooks, which aren't bad, but I'm probably not going to buy them unless I'm in school. And just now we're starting to get a few, text, few texts out that are focusing on individual agroforestry practices or some of the products. And I think that we need to keep doing more of that and getting just media involved in general. This is talking about agroecology and justice and food systems are critical to empower people to feed themselves. This came out in the Huffington blog, I think, on Friday. So those words are starting to come out there, but if you Google agroforestry, you're not going to find it in this type of media. And if we want to keep going forward, we need to change how we're thinking about how we're packaging agroforestry and who we're selling it to and how we're selling it to them. So thank you, and I'm ready for any questions. <laughs>